So we are starting a brand new series, and I'm going to let Pastor Josh uh, do the whole launch on this series, but I want to lay the groundwork this morning, and we are going to be in Luke chapter 19, Luke 19, starting in verse 1. And so go ahead and uh, turn there on your electronic device or your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the uh, seats underneath in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, take that one with you, okay? Or if you want to give it away to somebody, go ahead and do that as well. We have plenty and we can get more. The sermon series that we're going to be starting is called There, T H E R. E. I had to think about how to spell that uh, for a moment. Uh, but um, and so there were very um, important and powerful things that took place in people's lives because they were there. Oftentimes things take place and they happen and we miss it because we weren't there, Right? And there are many reasons as to why we are either there or why we are not there, okay? And uh, so we're going to be uh, exploring and discovering uh, the truths of God's Word based upon that premise over the next several weeks and really seeing how God wants to use the value of intentional presence. Remember our values? If you need a reminder of that, go to our website and click on the values of who we are, and you can see those listed there. But the value of being intentionally present, I am intentionally uh, going there. I'm being present with somebody. I am being present with God. How many have been at church and your mind is like a thousand miles away? Your body is here in the seats, but you are not. All right? So uh, it really is developing within our our hearts and within our spirits uh, the importance of being intentionally present because God is intentionally present with us, okay? And we're going to see that today in Luke chapter 19. So forgive me if I go on a little bit of a fast forward or speed or something like that, but I would like to try to cover a few items that I believe the Lord would want to um, uh, show us this morning. And so we're going to start in verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1, and it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Uh, Jesus, uh, just to give you a little background information, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die. All right, we are coming to the, the moment where he enters Jerusalem and there's a triumphant entry. Remember, they are waving Branches, Hosanna, they're embracing him. And in just a few days, they are crying, crucify him. And Jesus is, uh, and we're not going to go through all of that, but you, you, you know all that he went through. So this is leading right up. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he passes through Jericho. Now, Jericho, this isn't like, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. That, this is not that Jericho. Okay, that Jericho was destroyed and was never rebuilt. This is a new Jericho that was uh, established about a mile north of the Old Testament city. But it was in a very important city because of its location. Travelers would be doing everything they could just to get to Jericho. Oh, we're on our way to Jerusalem and we finally, we can rest at Jericho. There was an oasis there and, and they could refresh themselves. It was also a very important trade city. So Jesus is uh, on, traveling and he's passing through there. But I want to draw our attention to the previous verses back up in Luke 18, uh, 35 through 43. There was a beggar, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And he, he, uh, he was sitting in the dirt hoping to get a few coins to, to, um, to survive for the day. And he heard that Jesus was passing by. And when he heard that Jesus was passing by, Bartimaeus started crying out to Jesus. And we're not going to go through all of the details of that this morning, although it is a really powerful um, 
um, yeah, you got it. It's powerful. <laughs> Boom. Okay, so uh, he's crying out and he's pressing in. People are telling him to shut up, but he keeps pressing. And he's saying, uh, Jesus, son of David, very kingly, you know, you're, you're the king, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops goes over to him and says, what do you want? And the, the blind beggar says, I want to see. And, and Jesus said, well, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And it says immediately he received his sight, okay? And the place goes nuts, right? As they should if something were to happen like that, right? That's the appropriate response. Somebody received, blind receives their sight, Nuts, okay? That's, uh, I just want to prep the church. If that ever happens, that's our response on that, okay? So, um, so this is reverberating through Jericho. The news of what has happened, Bartimaeus is like, he's doing laps in the, ci- in the city, and it's getting out there, all right? So look in verse 2. It says, a man was there. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. In fact, some of the translations read he was very wealthy, okay? Israel at this time is under uh, Roman occupation, and it's harsh. It's contentious. It's violent. It's cruel. It is not fair. Okay, and the Romans would contract with Jewish tax collectors. They would uh, they would sell the contract for the Jewish tax collectors to collect the tax that Rome required. Okay, and um, that they didn't really care how much the tax collectors collected, as long as Rome got its cut. Do, Do you see where this is headed? Right? Okay, that, that just opens the door to all kinds of corruption, all kinds of abuse of power, um, and that is exactly what took place. Um, tax collectors were not appreciated um, by, by the people, but Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector, but he was a policymaker. He was an enforcer of those policies. He was a regional chief tax collector, which means he could set the policy as to how much these other tax collectors could abuse and how much his cut was going to be on top of that, and then Rome would get, you can see that it was just not a, a good thing. But it is interesting that blind Bartimaeus was poor, was a poor beggar in the dirt, and Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man in a seat of power. But they were both seeking something. They were both in need of something. And it's interesting to know that Zacchaeus' name literally means pure or righteous one. (laughs) Not quite living up to his name or that kind of reputation. But look in verse 3. It says he wanted Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. Zacchaeus was vertically challenged, and it was causing a problem for him. Um, In this moment where the crowds were gathered around Jesus, when the Josiahs of the world stand in front of you, and you, you know, the Kevins stand in front of you and the Ryan Coglins, get away, you mountain. <laughs> it's hard to see around them. But look at verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was. I think that statement is played over and over and over in our lives, even today. That we want to see who Jesus really is. Right? I mean, we, we, we hear about Jesus touching somebody's life. 
We hear that Jesus, there was a miracle that happened and, and, and somebody was healed of a sickness or some need was met because they cried out to Jesus. We hear of all of these things and we, deep within us, we're, we're, we're curious. I, I want to know what Jesus, who is this Jesus? Is, this, is, is he real? Is this just some sort of, you know, uh, dream state that people, you know, hype themselves up to? Or who is this Jesus? And I think there are people that are curious, just like, G just like Zacchaeus. And they want to see Jesus, but there's something in their way. I think it's interesting that the Bible mentions that, that Zacchaeus was short, and it wasn't just so that we would have that nice little children's thing, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. You know, it's not, it wasn't just so that we could, you know, have that kind of thing. I think that it gives us a little bit of an insight into what he is dealing with. How many of you know that when you see bad behavior, from somebody or wrong actions from somebody or you're on the receiving end of those there's always some deeper meaning as to why those things are happening it isn't just a surface conflict with somebody else there's always something that has happened in our lives that is trying to define us trying to to set into place um, who we are and the restrictions of what, we, uh, of what we will be, whether they're hurtful words or hurtful actions or whether it's abuse, those kinds of things begin to build up within our lives so that when we get to this point, our actions are a result of these things that we have endured. Does that resonate with anybody? Am, am I right on that? I, I think I am. Perhaps, and obviously this is just Todd, you know, just reaching for something. But perhaps Zacchaeus was bullied. Perhaps because he was short, he got to a point where he said, I will show them. Just wait. Perhaps it's insight. I think even for us, there are things that we walk through where the enemy of our souls wants that to define us and wants that to control us, wants that to be um, a catalyst for the behaviors of our life. I, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that we justify any behavior. No. There's no justification. But we can look for the reason. We can look for the reason. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. So look at verse 4. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus, since Jesus was coming that way. Okay? So Zacchaeus is determined. If you remember blind Bartimaeus, he was determined too. I mean, people said, shut up. You know, you shouldn't be shouting. And it says he shouted all. I won't do it because, you know, Micah, I don't want to hurt him up there. But he's thumbs up back there. Okay. Um, but he shouted all the more. He just would not give up. Zacchaeus was determined here. And so he said, look, I am going to. Um, I'm going to find a way to get a perspective on Jesus. Now walk with me here. A perspective on Jesus. Okay? It's very interesting. He, he goes and he finds this, this sycamore tree. This is, uh, if you ever, you can Google it, a uh, sycamore fig tree. Uh, great climbing tree. You, you'd want one of these in your backyard for the kids to climb on. Um, however, it's interesting. It is not native to Israel it is foreign to that place just like Zacchaeus was foreign to his people 
right? He was there in, in Jericho, but nobody was happy when Zacchaeus ding-donged on the front door, right? Nobody was thrilled when they bumped into Zacchaeus at the marketplace. Nobody, he was like a foreigner in that place. And I just, find it, I just find it interesting, the symbolism, that the tree that he climbed was not even foreign to, to that region. But he takes refuge and he climbs up into that tree and he retreats there. Bartimaeus pressed through the crowd to get to Jesus, to get there. There being the place where, you, where he could encounter Jesus, where he could actually be face to face with Jesus. This perspective with Jesus, right? But Zacchaeus, he, he comes up with a, you know, you think, hey, this is a pretty good strategy, all right? You're shorter, you can't see over, over the, the people. You've got to, you know, climb, get, get higher, get above them, right? This seems like a good strategy. Like, way to go. You're a problem solver, and, and you've, you've got it, right? But it, it actually took him further away from Jesus. He didn't go toward Jesus. He actually retreated. He said, well, Jesus is going to come this way, so I'll run further away. And I'll retreat up this tree, and I'll get a different perspective. Zacchaeus actually put himself in a position where he would never come face to face with Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit brought that to my attention, I thought, oh, isn't that what we do? Oftentimes we say, oh, I desire God in my life. Oh, I want, to, I want my faith to grow. I, I want to experience the promises that God have, has in his word. I, 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 I truly want these things, but our actions don't place us in a position to encounter it. We actually oftentimes, and I have done it myself, I come up with a clever strategy to get a perspective on Jesus, but never come close to him. Is this resonating with anybody? We're so curious and we long to see what Jesus is about, but things that are messy and complicated and uncomfortable and embarrassing, things out of our past, hurts and emotions start coming to the surface. All of these things begin to... to Crowd in like those that were crowding in front of Zacchaeus. And instead of pressing through those things, instead of, of, of waiting there, there in the moment and, and being determined to go there to be with Jesus, those things, those shadows get cast upon us and we choose to watch from a distance. But look in verse 5. It says, when Jesus reached the spot. I wrote in the, in the margin of my, my Bible, Jesus got there. Right? It says, when Jesus reached the spot, meaning the sycamore tree spot, the strategy of Zacchaeus, this, this plan that he had, when Jesus reached that place, Jesus looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. I mean, what? 
I, I mean, just picture this in your mind, right? I mean, it, it is nuts. It is pandemonium. I mean, if, if everybody, I mean, you saw these families as they got up and started coming. That was, that was a group of people, all right? Multiply that by hundreds and hundreds, and they're all like ping pong balls bouncing off of each other, and, you know, it is crazy. You probably can't even hear yourself talk to each other. And yet Jesus, who should be on mission to the cross, right? This is his purpose, right? He should be focused, you know, keep blind, right there, Jesus, keep going this way to Jerusalem, right? He should be focused, and yet he takes the time to stop there, I don't know, but in my mind, I see this coming, and when Jesus stops, I see that whole thing where everybody bumps into him, you know? <laughs> like, like somebody 40 yards back is like, what's going on up there? Move it! Oh, sorry, Jesus, you know, and... He stops at the spot, and he looks up. I wrote down, he stops and begins to search. You know, in my strategy to find God, it's always me searching. But here, Jesus stops, and he looks up, and he begins to search. And he finds Zacchaeus, and then he says, Zacchaeus, I must go there. I must go to that place, that personal place, that place where you retreat to each day, that place where you hide your private hurts and failures, that place where you keep your unfulfilled dreams buried, that place where you strain to figure out uh, all the ways out of your, your many troubles, that place where you struggle with your sin and wrong behavior, that secret place where your titles mean nothing and your possessions mean nothing, that place where you search for true purpose in your life only to find loneliness and pain. That's the place that I must go to. And I tell you what, that's the place that we try to hide, that we don't let anybody go to. We want them all to see the titles. We want them all to see the actions. We want to divert them. We come up with strategies to keep our distance from them. We want to observe, but from over here, because I can control it over here. But Jesus... He wants to go there. Oh, man, when I read that, I just was like, <laughs> it's interesting that he calls Zacchaeus by his name. Now, there could have been introductions <laughs> at some place, but the Bible is silent on that. And so, because it's silent, Jesus knew his name. Jesus knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows the strategy that you are walking out. He knows the desire of your heart he is searching for you. C close your eyes. Jesus is searching for you. There's nothing spiritual about closing your eyes. <laughs> it just helps create a moment, a personal moment. Jesus is searching for you. He says to, um, to Zacchaeus, I don't want to just do a, a drive-by your house, right? You know what a drive-by is, right? That's where the guy with the paper in the car, 
okay? Right? He's driving, and he does one of those left-handed hook shots and misses your porch and everything. It lands in the grass, you know, the place where your pet is. You know, we won't even get there, okay? That is a drive-by. That, that is just skimming the curb. That's not what Jesus wanted. Jesus said, I must go to stay. What? You mean this isn't just going to be a religious experience? You mean I won't just be come to church and, you know, and then, and then I can mark it in my diary and then every year, remember the time I was at church and it was like, ah, you know, and, and that was just so good. And No, it's not just uh, this one-time thing. Jesus wants to stay there. He wants a transformation to take place, and I wish we had the time to unpack the actual trans, uh, transformation that takes place. But in verse 6, Zacchaeus came down, and he, wa- he welcomed Jesus gladly. You know, his first response um, was to retreat and run away from Jesus, but then this encounter with Jesus drew him. <laughs> he made a wise decision. Have you made a wise decision with Jesus? Have you encountered Jesus in some way? Has he tugged at your heart, knocked at your heart's door, said, hey, let me come in and stay with you? Let's jump forward to uh, to verse 7. All the people saw what was taking place and how Jesus was reaching out to this sinner. Um, That's what the word calls him. In fact, the the Jewish community, uh, if you wanted a definition of sinner, you would just look up Zacchaeus in the dictionary, tax collector. They would just say, example of sinners, tax collectors. They were synonymous with each other. But Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector slash sinner. He was the chief of sinners. He was the worst of sinners. And I don't know how many people that I have encountered all around this world, and they have said, I don't know how God can love me because of the things that I have done, because of the, 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 the junk that is, that is deep within, inside me. I've heard that time and time and time again. But I want to draw your attention to verse Verse 10, where it says, today salvation can come to this house, and this is the reason that I have come, to seek and to save that which is lost. Okay, it doesn't matter how, how, what, the, what the road that we have walked, it doesn't matter what has led us to be up in that tree, just getting a perspective of Jesus. That doesn't matter to Jesus. He is drawn to us. Are you, are you hearing me? He's drawn to us. Where the world will say, no, you should be drawn to the, to the ones that have everything together. You should be drawn to the, to the pretty ones, to, to the ones that are successful. Here's the image of what you, what you should be drawn to. Jesus says, no, I'm drawn to everyone. I've come to seek and to save those that are lost, those that are broken. I want to go there. This is a prophetic word for our church. In a few moments, we're gonna have, I'm going to give an opportunity for us to respond to this. But this is a prophetic moment for our church of who will we be? Will we continue to ju- just be the church that is on the corner of Tara Lane and Cooper Foster, that, that church of Amherst? Or will we say that we are a people that are bound to love, that are compelled by the love of Jesus to go there? to go in to the broken places of our county, to go into Oberlin and Illyria and Lorraine and in our backyard of Amherst. Are we willing to go there because Jesus wants to go there? And we are God's ambassadors. Hear me, friends. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are Christ's ambassadors as though he is making his appeal through us 
to them. What? I know I have preached on this before, but God wants to use us to reach them. Us to go there. Because he wants to go there. On your connection card, if you're new to our church, this is one of the ways that we respond to the word. Is on the back of the connection card, there are some spaces. And we always uh, give a question or a statement that would spur on some sort of response. In light of the scriptures that we have walked through this morning, let's respond to this statement, to this inquiry. Explain one area in your life where you need Jesus to go there. Friends, I'm, I'm been around enough to know that just because you come to church doesn't mean that you've allowed Jesus to go there. And so there are a couple different responses as you are writing this and responding in written form. I also want to appeal to you. Have you experienced Jesus coming into your heart and being there with you? Have you just maybe always been around the, the perimeter but never face to face with Jesus? My friend, I want to invite you this morning to surrender your heart and your life to the one that's, who's been searching for you. Who knows you by name. Well, if he knows me, why does, doesn't he, he just perform one of those miracles and everything will be okay? Right? That's how we respond oftentimes. But Jesus wants to not just begin to refine the things that are on the outside. He wants to transform us on the inside. That eternal part of us. Right? This flesh, it's going to die. It's, it, th this flesh is not all of me. Right? I've got a spirit side of me. It's the hardest part of me to discern, but it's there. And, he, and it's eternal. And that's the part that Jesus wants to come in and save and renew and begin to transform. And then all of these things that are, are part of the flesh, all of the peripheral type stuff, that begins to be refined. Once he goes there. So, will you allow him to go there? Because that really is the, that really is the decision that Zacchaeus had to make. In that moment of the tree, he could have said, everybody's looking at me. No, I'm beneath, you know, no. He could have decided, no, this perspective is enough. I'm good. I'm okay. You keep your distance. I'll stay over here. He, Zacchaeus could have said that. And we can say that too. For Jesus will never force himself upon us. He simply gives us the choice. And he says, look, I've been searching for you. And, and I'm, in, I'm so intentional. I want to go there. I want to stay with you. Let me in. 
What will you decide, friends?